This is session seven of the Foundations and Finance module. And in this session, I'd like to take what we talked about last session, which is the time value of money, and apply it in valuing a contractual claim. In a contractual claim, here's what you have. At the time the contract is entered into, you're, you're told what the cash flows will be over the lifetime of the contract. The cash flows are set at the time of the contract. Those cash flows can be fixed. Fixed in what sense? 50 million a year every year for the next 10 years. $20 a year for the next 10 years. That is what you get with a fixed rate loan or a, or a traditional fixed rate bond. The cash flow could be variable over time, but the terms of variance are set again at the time of the contract. That's the case with a floating rate loan. In a floating rate loan, I might tell you that I will pay 1% more than inflation each year for the next 10 years. My cash flows will vary across time, but they will vary in a contractually set way. Each year, I'll observe the inflation and add 1% to it. They're both contractual claims. The first is a little easier to think about than the, than the second. But let's start by first introducing the notion of default risk. Remember, in a contract, the promisor is promising to pay you the cash flows in the contract. But promisors don't always deliver on their promises. If the promisor has no default risk, the claim is said to be a risk-free claim. You're saying, what kind of promisor has no default risk? The only type of promisor who has a chance of not having default risk is, the, is a government. Why? Because governments can print currency. That said, not all government claims are risk-free. So while all risk-free claims have to be issued by governments, not all government claims are risk-free. The second sounds mysterious. Think about a claim from the Argentine government, the Venezuelan government, the Greek government. Clearly, these are government bonds issued, but they're not risk-free. Now, if there is default risk, things get a little messy and we have to adjust the value of the bond for default risk. But let's take the easy scenario first. Let's think about valuing a fixed rate risk-free bond. To value a fixed rate risk-free bond, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to discount the coupons and the face value of the bond, which are known at the time that I do the valuation at the risk-free rate. So I'll take an example. Let's assume the U.S. government is default-free. It has to be an assumption because there are no guarantees. Let's assume you're trying to price a, a U.S. government bond with 10 years left to maturity and a 3% coupon rate. This bond could have been issued 10, 15, 20 years ago, but there are only 10 years left on it. It's got a 3% coupon rate. Let's assume that the market interest rate today on a 10-year U.S. Treasury bond is 2%. That's a market risk. That's a risk-free rate today. So here's what I'm going to do. To value this bond, I'm going to take the coupons, which are 3% of face value, and bonds are conventionally priced on a $1,000 face value. So it's $30 here for the next 10 years. And I'm going to take the $1,000 face value, uh, face value at the end, and I'm going to discount them all back at my current market interest rate of 2%. I've used the notation I've created for time value, which is I'm trying to compute the present value of an annuity. The $30 is an annuity with a 10-year period and a 2% interest rate. And I get the present value of the coupons. So the first term in this equation is the present value of the coupons. The second term is the present value of the face value. What I get is the sum of those two numbers is 1,089.83. That would be the value of the bond today. Just as an aside, I've cheated here, and here's how I've cheated. Usually, when bonds pay coupons, they pay them every six months, at least in the U.S. So if I were a purist here, I should really have been taking $15 every six months rather than $30 every year. That would have altered my value a little bit, but I, to keep things simple, I'm going to act like the coupons are annual. This bond is described often as trading at above par. You're saying, what's par? Par is $1,000. That's a face value. It's trading above par. There's no mystery why it's trading above par. It's trading above par because the market interest rate on this bond is less than the coupon rate. If the market interest rate had been higher than the coupon rate, it would have been trading at a discount. If market interest rates were equal to the coupon rate, the bond will trade at par. Now, having priced that bond, let's do a few what-ifs. Let's assume that after you've bought this bond, um, you let's assume that after you bought the, bought the bond, a day later, you look at the price and the price is down to 1,043.76. So you know the price of the bond has dropped and you want to know what interest rate is embedded in that price. This is when you compute what's called the yield to maturity in a bond. Sounds fancy, but the yield to maturity is that discount rate that makes the present value of your coupons and the face value equal to the price of the bond. It's an internal rate of return. 
So in this case, here's the setup. I know the price of the bond is 1043.76. Since it's only one day in, I still have $30 in coupons every every year for the next 10 years and 1000 at the end of the 10th year. I solve for R. And I solve for R. The discount rate that I get is 2.5%. You're saying, what does that mean? That is the market interest rate. Remember yesterday it was 2%. The rates went from 2 to 2.5%. Two the price of my bond, not surprisingly, dropped from 1089 plus to 1043.76. Now, there is a related concept called yield as opposed to yield to maturity. And the yield on a bond is a far simpler measure. Here's what you do when you compute the yield on a bond. You divide the coupon, the $30, by the price of the bond. You get 2.87%. Notice that the yield and the yield to maturity move in the same direction, but the yield to maturity is a more precise measure of the actual rate of return you're making on the bond, but it does require more work to get there. Now, building further on this concept, let's introduce another notion. Let me go back to the 3% 10-year coupon bond that we valued at 1,043.76. That was based on a 2.5% interest rate, right? Now, let's assume that market interest rates go from 25 to 3.5%. Remember, if interest rates go up, the present value of the coupons and the face value will drop. And not surprisingly, the bond price drops from 1,043.76 to 958.41. That's an 8.18% drop in the price. You think, so what? Hang in there. If instead of going up, interest rates had gone down from 2.5% two, from to 1.5%, a 1% drop in interest rates, well, the bond is going to get more valuable. In this case, the bond price will jump to 1,138.33, which is an increase of 9.06%. You still might be wondering, so what? A 1% increase in interest rates caused my price to drop by 8.18%. A 1% drop in interest rates caused my price to go up by 9.06%. My percentage change in price when rates drop by a fixed amount was much greater than the percentage change in price when, my, when rates went up by that same amount. That's called bond convexity. It's neither here nor there. You're saying, so what? But if you hear talk about bond convexity, it's talking about this, this specific aspect of bonds and how the price of a bond adjusts to interest rates. So let's introduce a couple of propositions that come from this present value equation. As I extend the maturity of a bond, it is going to get more sensitive to changes in interest rates. I'll show you the numbers first, and then we'll talk about the intuition later. Here, I have a one-year bond, a five-year bond, a 10-year bond, and a 30-year bond. They're all corporate, bo they're all U.S. Treasury bonds, and in each case, I've taken a two and a half percent market interest rate and changed to three and a half and a one and one and a half percent apiece, and looked at the percentage change in price with a 30-year bond, a 20-year bond, 10, a five-year, and a one-year. So, if you look at the 30-year bond. Notice that for uh, that when when rates go down and rates go up, the percentage change in price is much greater than for a 10-year bond, which in turn is much greater than for a 5-year bond, which in turn is much greater than for a 1-year bond. You should get the intuition, right? The reason this is happening is time value of money. With a 30-year bond, my big cash flow, which is my face value, is way out in the future. So if interest rate change, the effect of those changes is much greater. Okay. So the longer the maturity of a bond, the more sensitive it is going to be to changes in interest rates. Long-term bonds will be affected by interest rate changes, by, by a given interest rate change more than a short-term bond. Here's my second proposition. Holding all else constant, if I make my coupon rate lower, my bond price is going to get more sensitive to interest rate changes. Here, for instance, I've graphed out five different coupon rates, actually six different coupon rates ranging from 0% to 5%. At a 0% coupon rate, I basically have a zero coupon bond. You're saying, what do I even get with a zero coupon bond? If it's a 10-year bond, you get nothing for the next 10 years, and at the end of the 10th year, you get the $1,000 back. Now, a 1%, a 2%, 3%. See what's happening here? As I raise my coupon rate, I am front-ending my cash flows a little bit more, and the effect of changing interest rates is smaller on me. So as my coupon rate goes up, I will get less sensitive to interest rate changes. So the longer the mature of a bond, the more sensitive I'm going to be to interest rate changes. The lower the coupon rate on my bond, the more sensitive the price is going to be to interest rate changes. Now let's introduce the notion of default risk. It is true that when the contract is written, the promise agrees to pay you what's in the contract. But if you have a promise who can default, clearly you will not pay as much for that same bond than for an equivalent bond with no default risk. 
So the question is, how do you bring that risk into the process? The risk that you will not be paid your coupons near face value is often described as default risk or credit risk. And here's how bond pricing works. You still, when you try to value a bond, keep the promise cash flows. You're saying, that's so hopelessly unrealistic. Hang in there. I use the same promise cash flows, knowing fully well that I might not get paid. But when I discount those cash flows, I discount them back, not at the risk-free rate, but at a rate that reflects both the risk-free rate and the default risk that I have. And the additional amount that I will add to the risk-free rate to cover the default risk is called the default spread. Sounds abstract, right? But let's make this real by looking at measures of default risk. Until about 100 years ago, banks were the only entities that assessed default risk to decide whether to lend money. And it was a secret of process that you couldn't look into. About 100 years ago, the first ratings agency showed up, primarily because people wanted to buy bonds. And these people couldn't do the same kind of assessment that banks did. So the very first ratings agencies, S&P and Moody's, attach letter-grade ratings for bonds. And the ratings range from AAA down to D. A AAA bond is considered to be the lowest default risk. Now, you are trusting ratings agencies when you take the, the rating of a bond. But to the extent that ratings agencies do their homework, this becomes a proxy for default risk. So the default spread is what you charge based on the default risk of a bond. So in, in, in January 2017, for instance, if you bought a AAA rated bond, that is considered the safest among the corporate bonds, the spread you'd have charged is 0.6%. What does that mean? If the risk-free rate is 2.5% or 2.25%, you would add the 0.6% to reflect the fact that there's default risk in the bond. So to price a AAA rated bond, you'd take the coupons in the bond and discount it back at an interest rate that included the 0.6%. If your bond were a triple B rated bond, the spread in 2017 would have been 1.6%. So here's what you do. You take the risk-free rate, you'd add 1.6% to it, and essentially discount the coupons and the face value back at that rate. And if it were a triple C rated bond, which is even higher risk, you'd take 6.5%, which is the default. So essentially what's happening is your the rate you're charging will get raised based on the default risk. And the more default risk there is, the higher the discount rate you will use to discount those promised coupons and, and, and face value. And what you get as a value for the bond will already reflect default risk. So let's try this out. Let's assume that you're trying to value a bond with default risk. Let's make it a triple B rated 3% coupon rate 10-year corporate bond. Let's say it's January 2017. Let's say the risk-free rate is 2.5%. And let's say the default spread is 1.75%. It's really 1.6, but let's say it was 1.75%. So 2.5% plus 1.75% gives me a discount rate of 4.25%. I still have the $30 coupon and the $1,000 face value because that's determined by the coupon rate and the face value. I discount the coupons and the face value back at 4.25%. What I get as a present value is $899.87. That is the value of a triple B rated coupon, um, a triple B rated bond with a 3% coupon rate. The mechanics of pricing a, a default a bond with default risk are no different than the mechanics of pricing a risk-free bond. The number that's going to change is the discount rate that you're using. Rather than use the risk-free rate, you'll add the risk-free rate to the default spread. And that then becomes the basis for for valuing any contractual claim that has default risk in it. Now, if you take a closer look at that equation, you can see that the value of a corporate bond is going to be a function of how much default risk you see in the bond. So that bond that is rated triple B, if tomorrow you woke up and discovered that the company had done something awful and its rating had dropped to single B, the default spread will widen, the interest rate will go up, and even though the coupon and the face value stay the same, the price of the bond will drop. Incidentally, if your rating drops below triple B, you're considered below investment grade. Triple B is the dividing line between investment grade bonds and non-investment grade. And it goes back to history. There was a point in time where only investment grade bonds could issue bonds into market. So that magical line still remains and many companies blanch at the thought of dropping below investment grade. But if your, if your rating drops below triple B, you go to double B, single B, the rate the interest rates on those bonds will go up and you're classified as high yield bonds. Again, a classification class for any bonds that are below investment grade. Now, just as an aside on floating rate bonds, you say, how do I do this? 
if a floating rate bond is set right, in other words, the interest rate each period is reset to the market interest rate that year. It's like a collection of short-term bonds at the fair market interest rate each year, right? So the short answer to the question of how do I price floating rate bonds is if they're priced right, you should price them at par. To the extent that the reset at the interest rate is not perfect, you're not getting a perfect reset to the market interest rate, the, mark, the value of a floating rate bond might not be quite par value, but it's never going to vary as much as an otherwise similar fixed rate bonds. So I know this is bond pricing 101. There are lots of shades of gray we haven't looked at, but the mechanics of what we've talked about illustrates how time value of money and understanding the coup and understanding the basics of default spread are sufficient in order to price or value a bond.